happened to my one that had everything broken down? But I know, and I don't know why. I mean, I set it all together. I think maybe, I think maybe when they opened the door, it blew away. No, it's just it's the time. So. So our next speaker is going to be talking about the FAA safety team. And there are a, a number of those around the country. We, of course, just bear, mostly know about the ones here. So Ray Bear will give us a rundown on the FAST team. Thank you, Beth. Many of you may not know this, but the first one of these uh, safety seminars that occurred between Quad A and Fiesta occurred in 1991. And every year since, the Quad A has been diligent in trying to provide this service to people that don't always have the opportunity at home. So I'd like to take just a minute to say, Don Boyer and company, thank you very much. The second point I would make is I too have driven in Australia somewhat extensively, and I too had the cleanest windshield in the country. <laughs> the questions that I've put up on the slide frequently come up when we meet after flying or we're coming into a new town or something like that. And they're questions that sort of you don't know who to ask them of. And one suggestion I would make is that you should ask them of your local FAA safety team representative. So today I'm just going to take a few minutes, not very long, to talk a little bit about the FAA safety team and how it might be a resource for you. <clears throat> I'm Ray. Most of you know me, I think. I used to be an examiner. I'm now an ex-examiner. I examined for about 26 years and uh, did over 500 check rides. And it occurred to me this morning when I was standing out on the field, I wonder how many of these people out here am I responsible for? Be because I begin to worry a little bit about that. <laughs> I see a lot of hands out there, so there are at least a few of you. It was a good experience, but it was time to move on and make room uh, for somebody else. The, um, it wasn't the FAA when we started out, and it wasn't the FAA safety team, but responsibility for aviation safety has always been an important issue for the FAA. Nancy started her talk this morning by pointing out how important a priority that has been for the FAA. Back in 1946, I guess, uh, is, is a good landmark of when it started. Um, but more importantly, about 1958, we abolished the CAA and established the FAA. At that time, it was the Federal Aviation Agency, and it wasn't until about, what, five years later, in 1963, that uh, the agency became an administration that came in under the Department of Transportation. But throughout that period, it's still been an important aspect of safety information. The, the important thing about 1963 was they began to include industry volunteers and industry participants. And that's when we had the aviation safety counselors. That's sort of my, as far back as my real memory goes, uh, we had those uh, uh, counselors at that time. It wasn't until 19, or 2006 that we actually established the FAA safety team uh, representatives. Are there any FAA safety team representatives in this room? Raise your hand if you would, please. Okay, so I see one, two, three. Maybe there's some in the back. Four or five. Four or five, at least, in the room. And these should be considered an important resource uh, for the rest of you. There's a variety of... Uh, Place. Oh, I, I, I put this up there just because I wanted to include it in your package. I'm not going to read it to you. Uh, I don't like people that read slides. 
sides, and so I'm not going to be one of them. But, but it is important that you understand what their mission is, and it's, it's not just to talk about safety, but it's to provide uh, aspects such as a safety seminar of this nature and consultation in general to try to improve aviation safety in general. Well, there are some situations where those representatives might be of value to you. And I've tried to identify a few of those, if I can figure out where I'm at. Derek, you here to help me? Thank you. It went away. That's what I wanted. Okay, here's one. How about flying too low? Now, I wasn't picking on Arabelle here, but it was a good picture that showed Arabelle coming over the museum. Most of us are, in fact, if guilty, if that's the word you want to use, about flying too low. And sometimes that results in a report from a friendly neighbor or even from a law enforcement agency that's keeping an eye on you that's in the field and the report comes in. Situations like this, as you know, frequently there are extenuating circumstances, and there are reasons that you may have been flying too low. And discussing those with your uh, FAST team representatives can be a good way to have an intermediary, if you will, that might help you to understand what went on, maybe even help you through the reporting process and provide uh, some information uh, in that case. Usually we're, we're landing or taking off, and, and according to the regulations, that's okay, but an observer or a person out on the street may not realize that and decide that uh, there should be a report filed. How about this one? Conflicts among balloons and pilots. Now, this isn't so much an FAA. By the way, it doesn't always happen at a... Um, registration party where we're flying the helium balloons off the table. Conflicts among balloons happen when we're coming into targets or a variety of other circumstances as well. And so hopefully we can help to resolve those by having the people who are involved in the conflict talk together and maybe the uh, FAST team representative can represent the adult in the room or the cooler head that might help just make it a discussion Usually it's uh, con contributed by two people involved in the uh, conflict, but, but we, again, hopefully we can resolve it without it getting any more serious. We can talk to the participants. I say talk them off the limb. What I'm trying to do there is just make it a calmer situation where we can discuss what happened and how we might uh, avoid it in the future. One of the things that the uh, FAA FAST team representatives should attempt to do is to uh, sort of acknowledge good behavior. Uh, too often we're all out there looking at what somebody's doing wrong, and if we just take a little bit of time sometimes when folks are doing things right or doing them well, uh, we can maybe change the culture a little bit uh, for, the, for the better. And finally, I would say that we can provide a little bit of education. Um, did I do that okay? Um, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, in one of my earlier slides where I talked about some of the questions you ask, uh, when you come into a new town, it would be great to know uh, what the good directions are, what the bad directions are, where the launch sites are, and that sort of thing. Your FAST team, team representative should know the answer to those kind of questions and be able to help you as, as well. <clears throat> so, I've tried to point out examples of where we can be of use to you as a resource. It can usually be in a very informal discussion. There's frequently not any documentation whatsoever unless you as the complainant or the question answerer uh, wants it to be. Uh, and sometimes the uh, FAST team representative might actually create a report of some kind of the conversation, but usually only if you want to. The, uh, when I asked for hands here, we only got four or five, so there were, maybe we're a rarer breed than I thought. 
But here in the Albuquerque area, we have three FAST team representatives. Uh, J.D. Huss, who you heard speak earlier, uh, Beth Wright Smith, who is, uh, I, I almost did that uncomplimentary by saying she's an old hand at this game. Uh, <laughs> but she knows a hell of a lot, let's face it. And she's an excellent resource. Uh, and myself, I am one of the old hands too. And if you read my bio there, I, I tried to find the picture that was young enough to make me look good and uh, old enough so it sort of looked like me. And if you read the bio, it says uh, something like, he was once as young as the photographic suggests. And I was, but it's a, a time past. Um, for other areas other than Albuquerque, or for any area for that matter, you can visit faasafety.gov. And there, there is a list of resources, and un, or excuse me, a, a directory under resources that will list all of the uh, FAST team representatives uh, that are available to you. Now the difficulty is it doesn't say anything about LTA experience, or fixed wings or helicopters or anything else. So you may have to search around. Now, no, normally what happens is the same thing with finding an examiner. You'll find a list, if you will, of examiners. Well, you need to call the first one and then maybe they can suggest, well, you need to talk to someone else. Uh, but I encourage you to do so and hopefully they would uh, be of help. So that's all I wanna say for today and I wanna invite up uh, the good-looking bear, wherever he went. This is my son, Dave, and he'll give you a presentation on rope tricks. We're gonna watch him do some lassoes. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the concept of tie-offs and quick releases. And as you may have heard during Fiesta, Using some sort of a tie-off is a requirement on the field, and it's recommended when you fly off-field uh, towards the field, uh, as well as typically for the GLOWs, a tie-off is required, and when we were out here Sunday night, uh, they even said that two tie-offs was required. So we're going to talk a little bit about tie-offs and quick releases and those sorts of things. Uh, one thing that I just wanted to highlight is, in your printed packet, um, I, I had a communication failure, and there are some documents that, that you did not get, but they are available on my website, so you can certainly feel free to go there if you want to write this address down. It's davebear.co, like Colorado, D-A-V-E-B-A-I-R.co, and you'll see a, a link in there for a Quad A Safety Seminar, and it's got handouts that you didn't get and it's got the actual PowerPoint slides that we're using today, so if you wanted to download those, look at them, study them, uh, you're certainly welcome to do that. Again, that's davebear.co. So um, uh, before we get into sort of the good stuff here, I wanted to start with an illustration of what a tie-off and quick release can do for you. Okay, who has seen this video before today? A handful of you, it was circulating on Instagram and Facebook and things like that. Uh, so this is an excellent illustration of both a tie-off and a quick release. He stayed tied off until he didn't, and then when he released, it was quick. Um, the, the commentary that went with this video was rather negative. Uh, you know, the person who posted the video said this, this looks super sketchy, it was really dangerous, I was scared to watch it. And then, uh, as you may have seen with social media, uh, a whole bunch of people sort of piled on to that and commented about, yeah, it was really bad, this was scary. Um, it wasn't excellent, and frankly, uh, I would say if you did this at the Balloon Fiesta, 
your name would probably be on the list to go to the tower the next day. Um, but uh, in fairness, uh, nobody was injured. The flight was fine. And so uh, you could argue that it was executed just fine. So let's talk a little bit about why we use tie-offs and why we use quick releases and sort of what all those different words mean. I didn't plan the Hitachi slide. Okay, so when I talk about quick releases and tie-offs, those are two different things. When I think of a tie-off, it's the thing that holds you on the ground. And that could be a rope, a strap, whatever. But the idea is I've connected my balloon typically to a vehicle with the intention of not leaving the ground. So that's what I mean tie-off. And then quick release is the thing that separates the tie-off from the balloon so that you can leave the ground when you're ready, okay? And so we're going to talk a little bit about both of those in terms of how you des design that equipment, how you use it, all of those sorts of things. Um, so when we talk about this tie-off and quick release, there's fundamentally four pieces of the equation that we want to look at. The first is what I'll call, and, and not all of these are required every time, but think about starting at the balloon and sort of working your way back to the vehicle. Uh, the first thing that we often see is a bridle. And so this is typically a piece of webbing. This one here is about four feet long. It goes between the two carabiners on the basket. And so that, the value of the bridle is it sort of squares up the basket so that you're connected to more than one uh, place on the equipment. And so when I use the term bridle, this is typically what I mean. And then again, as we, as we move away from the balloon, typically the next piece of equipment we're gonna see is a quick release. And we might see something like a three ring circus, um, we might see something like a Bonanno quick release. We might see a snap shackle. Um, we might see uh, one of these climbing eights. We might see a variety of different pieces of equipment. So that's typically your quick release. And then there's usually some piece of thing, rope or webbing most commonly, that goes from the quick release back towards the vehicle. That's the tie off. And so today we're going to talk mostly about ropes um, uh, for a couple reasons. One, they're more common. Uh, and two, uh, I have a strong preference to rope uh, over webbing. And so then the last piece in this tie-off setup is how do I attach it to my vehicle? So those are sort of the four pieces that we're going to talk about today. So we have a bridle, a quick release, a tie-off rope typically, and then a vehicle attachment. I feel like Zarek has just sort of abandoned us here. Oh, okay, gotcha. Got it, okay. So, when we think about the purposes of tie-offs, they have a lot of really good value. Now, at Fiesta, they're required because they want us to stay on the ground until the launch directors tell us we're okay to go. And they don't want balloons dragging across the field and those kinds of things. They want you to stay on the ground when they want you to stay on the ground and they want you to go when you're ready to go. Another couple of advantages of this sort of tie-off and quick release system in a launch situation is that I believe you can launch more safely in more conditions. So you can launch more safely if it's windier, if it's breezy, if you're in a tighter field, or for example, if you have less crew, or if your crew is less experienced and maybe doesn't know exactly what to do if, if the sort of balloon starts rocking around. And so the tie-off allows advantages in that sense to be able to, perfectly normal day, it allows you to have a great launch under more conditions. Now, excellent, thank you. Um, Plugging it in over there. Yay. How do I go forward? Uh, okay. okay, thank you. Well done, Zarek. I appreciate that. So, I've had some sort of negative commentary about tie-offs. This concept of if I ever had to inflate in enough wind to need a tie-off, I shouldn't be flying. I, that might be valid, and. The way I'd like to reframe that is, if it's ever windy enough to put my tie off under load, 
I shouldn't be flying. That might be a boundary. However, I suggest that if you use a tie-off every time, it will save your butt at least once, and you'll never regret having it. This is a picture here uh, of uh, my balloon, and you can see the burner frame is twisted halfway around. Uh, and this was after we aborted a cold inflation, and we started in absolutely dead calm winds. Four other balloons flew that day, and we had a significant gust. And as, as the wind came up and the balloon is rocking around, my student and I just casually said, you know what, I think we should be done. There was no yelling, no running around, no anxiety. And of course, the crew had been briefed. If at any time you feel uncomfortable, let go and walk away. So the two folks on the crown felt like things were getting out of control. They let go and backed off. They were both first time crew. And so in this sense, the tie off did all the work and totally took all the stress out of the situation. We didn't have to chase it around the field. We didn't have to yell at people, all those kinds of things. So I don't like to be stressed out. And so I use a tie off. Now, if you feel like a tie-off is a representation of sort of, you know, crazy pilots doing that kind of thing, I think it's just a backup safety mechanism and you don't have to worry too much about it. Um, there's also a, another video that you may have seen. Uh, another valid use of tie-offs, frankly, is to be able to launch in higher wind conditions. Now, there are some areas in the world, and especially when you're doing evening flights uh, at home. I live in Colorado. Typically in the evening, it's breezy when I launch. Uh, and then it gets gradually more calm. And you could have a very beautiful flight, but you'll have a breezy launch, and you can do that safely and calmly with a tie-off. So that's a lot of background on sort of why do we use those things, and it's just a nice sort of protection for us. Okay, we talked about the, the elements here. Uh, now... We talk a lot about tie-offs. Now, why do we use a quick release? Again, it's a separate piece of equipment. Um, it allows us to have a smooth, controlled launch as opposed to, uh, you know, just sort of running, at, chasing the balloon across the field. Uh, and you launch only when you're ready, uh, not when the wind comes up or whatever like that. Uh, and again, uh, you can perform launches, I believe, more safely. Uh, if you do get a wind gust, uh, you can use a tie-off to minimize your false lift. Uh, you can um, also do this, again, with less crew. Uh, I had an illustration a couple of weeks ago where I, I, I had a little bit of traffic, and I sent my crew chief out to check traffic. Well, I didn't have them around the basket, but the tie-off was doing the work, so I didn't worry about that much weight on. Um, one thing to note is that quick releases in general are not appropriate for static display. So if you're going to do a glow or something like that, you probably don't want a quick release, especially if you're going to do a glow in, uh, say, uh, uh, an area with a lot of spectators because they just might conveniently unhook that for you. And uh, that, can, uh, that can sort of go downhill in a real hurry. Um, and so, in general, I suggest that if, if you're doing a static display, use a tie-off, but not a quick release, typically is what I recommend. Okay, now, what are the negatives? Tie-offs and, and quick releases are not always per, uh, perfect, so I wanted to hit some highlights on why you wouldn't use it, uh, or maybe at least some negatives to be aware of. So, uh, when you've got this rope going from the, the basket to the truck, you've created a tripping hazard. You've created a thing that could go under tension quickly, and so that can be a risk that you have to manage. Uh, a second thing is uh, it takes up more space in the launch field because now I have to have a truck, and then I've got some space between the truck. And so, for example, uh, I fly in Colorado Springs. We have an event there at Labor Day. Uh, our launch squares are not big enough, and so tie-off is inconvenient. Uh, now, I still use it, but it, it just takes up more space and it's a little bit of hassle. Whereas if you just set up the balloon, you don't need as much space. Um, if you depend on your tie-off and it fails, things go downhill very quickly. Um, and that's sort of reasonable, except that if you've come to depend on your tie-off, then when things go downhill quickly, you may not really be prepared. You may not be at the basket, your crew may not be trained, all of those sorts of things. So when you become dependent on that, there is a risk that maybe you could become complacent. And if it does break, um, which I've seen it happen a few times, uh, it, things get crazy fast. Um, it, if you're used to using a tie-off, it could give you a false sense of confidence. It could give you the sense of, 
come on, it's only 25 knots. I've got a great tie-off, I can inflate. Um, this is, using a good tie-off is not permission to do dumb things. And so always check yourself and make sure that you're managing that nice margin of safety, even if your equipment could technically handle it. Um, it there's also a potential, especially when you're using this bridle, that after you leave the ground, and now it's just kind of in the way. It's hanging there, it's a hassle, it breaks up the eye line, it's in the pictures, you know, all of those sorts of things. Uh, and so it, it can be a little bit of a distraction that way. Uh, and then uh, it, it can be an extra task for the pilot at the end of the day or the crew right after you launch to remember to unhook that and pack it up. Driving away, dragging a 30-foot rope behind the truck, that, and that's not ideal. Um, so just it's one more thing for them to have to figure out. Um, and then uh, they do cost money. And, you know, you just spent all your money on this shiny new balloon, and now you've got to spend more money on a quick release. So we'll talk a little bit about money later, but it is a factor in a lot of stuff that we do. Okay, so we're going to do uh, three things, and I'm going to blow through a couple of them pretty quickly, and then we'll spend a lot of time at the end. Uh, so we're going to talk about expected loads. What, what, how big do we have to make this tie-off thing? Uh, and then how do we buy materials that are appropriate for those loads? And then we'll, we'll talk about some examples, and I've got some examples here, and we can talk about pros and cons of each. In, in my opinion, there is no ideal solution. Uh, I prefer some over others. Okay, so when we think about the physics of ballooning, uh, these things are big. Uh, and now just as a disclaimer, I have two disclaimers, one of them's on the slide. I'm not actually a physicist, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn once and it allows me to build an Excel sheet and so my graph looked pretty cool. The second disclaimer is all of the, the pictures and illustrations here are on four-sided baskets. It's not an affront to three-sided basket people. It's just that th there aren't really that many of those available when I was putting this slide deck together, so I just don't have a lot of pictures. Um, that, and that said, when I used to fly three-sided baskets, it, it is inherently trickier to get a, a good tie-off system on a three-corner basket. Uh, they, we, there are some that work okay, uh, but it is inherently tricky. Okay, so we've got three different kinds of load that are gonna go against your tie-off here. Number one is what I would call just the mass of air. How big is this balloon and how much weight are you moving around? And then the second thing is what I would call static loads. And if you're having a regular inflation and you've got some t tension on the rope, uh, what does that rope look like? What's the load there? And then dynamic loads. And we'll explain what those different things mean. <clears throat> okay, so the mass of air. Uh, you're carrying 70, 80, 90, 100,000 cubic feet of air, and that weighs something. We think of lighter than air, uh, so therefore the balloon must weigh roughly nothing. That's not quite true, um, and so we'll distinguish between the word weight and mass. It still has a tremendous amount of mass, and that's really all physicists care about. Weight is an imaginary concept, and so mass is really the number that we start to care about. And the, ma and the mass of air starts to depend on humidity, temperature, altitude, uh, pressure, all of those sorts of things. And we'll talk a little bit about how those vary. Uh, but the mass of your balloon is not constant all the time. It changes throughout the day. Um, but a good rule of thumb is the mass of air is roughly five hundredths of a pound per cubic foot. And so if you had a hundred thousand cubic foot balloon, you'll, you're going to be carrying roughly 5,000 pounds of air. Okay, that's a r rule of thumb. It's close depending on where you fly. Uh, so we've got a 90,000 cubic foot balloon that might weigh, might have a mass of about 4,500 pounds. So here's, a, here's an interesting question. On any given day, let's say this morning, at what point in the ballooning journey does your balloon have the most mass? This is the part where you talk. Cold inflation. Okay, I have one vote for cold inflating. When it's full, when you're hot inflating, when you stand up. So, the, it turns out that's actually a really tricky calculation, but we get to some data here, and this graph, it is not intended for you to read this, this graph, but I'll show you sort of the trend lines here, okay? So on the y-axis, it's the mass of air, and then on the 
x-axis here going across, uh, those are different altitudes. We're here at, in Albuquerque, it's about 5,000 feet. And so that puts us squarely in the blue box somewhere. And then all of these lines are at different degrees of humidity and temperature, okay? So you can see the four bottom lines and then the top line. The four bottom lines are the balloon is hot, and I used 212 degrees Fahrenheit at, at various humidity levels. And so um, the, the yellow line on the very bottom is a very humid day, and that light blue line is a very dry day. And so the mass of air goes down with humidity, okay? It's totally counterintuitive, but wet air weighs less than dry air. And how is that if you have a bucket of air and you add water to it? How does the bucket get lighter? It's a mystery, but it does. So those four lines are about when the balloon is hot, the sort of flying temperature. That top line, it's actually four lines stacked on top of each other, and that is the mass of air when it's cold. 68 degrees is what I chose as cold, sort of a nice inflation day out here, uh, maybe a second wave inflation, the temperatures we've had this week, um, but at the same levels of humidity. So at lower temperatures, the humidity is less of a factor of the mass. So the key here, oh, though, the takeaway here is that the balloon has more mass when it's cold than it does when it's hot. So arguably, the balloon has the most mass throughout the journey of the day when it is fully cold packed when you're about to start your hot inflation, assuming it's 100% full. And so thinking about tie-offs, that's the most critical strength factor is what's the mass of the balloon when it's fully packed and then I've got all of this load against it, okay? And then the balloon gradually gets lighter as the day goes on. Okay, so what are static load? That's sort of the mass of the thing. So I like to use in terms of just our regular hobby balloons, we're talking four or 5,000 pounds of air. Then you add another 500,000 pounds of equipment and, and then passengers and all that kind of stuff. So you're in the range of somewhere on the order of about 6,000 pounds of stuff that you're trying to contain. So then when you're cold inflating and you've got wind pushing on the envelope, that's a static load on that, on that tie-off. Those static loads, if you think about the calculations of uh, loads on a sail, for example, um, that load is variable. The load of the tie-off increases by the square of the wind speed. So if you've got five knots, it's one load. If you've got, if you've got 10 knots, it's not twice the load, it's four times the load. So as the wind increases, the static load on the line increases uh, exponentially. It goes much faster than that. So good rule of thumb, again, if you're thinking about these kind of 77, 90, 105, in a five knot wind um, and your tie off is, is loaded, it's, it's static, it's completely pulled tight, you've got somewhere on the order of 180 pounds of force that is being exerted on that balloon. So think about a crew person. They can hold that in five miles an hour, maybe two crew people, that kind of a thing. And when you get to 10 miles an hour, that's 725 pounds. Now you're talking about four or five crew people. Um, and then you get to a 15 mile an hour wind uh, and you've got 1,600 pounds of static force just from the wind load on this sail, okay? And so the, the force is just from the breeze. Uh, they, they climb very, very quickly. And remember that it's not the wind speed that was forecast last night, it's the wind speed that you're experiencing in every active second. So you get a gust, you get something that comes around the tree, all of those sorts of things, that wind load is not static. So you'll see the balloon sort of buffer and you can see tension change in the rope. Uh, but the point of this here is that even if you're doing everything right, in a moderate condition of 10 knots, uh, you've got quite a bit of load on that probably more load than people can conveniently handle on their own without a tie-off. Okay, so one of the things, therefore, is I recommend, if you're going to use a tie-off, connect it all up before you ever start the fan. Okay, when your balloon is in the bag or it's just streamered out, you don't have any air in it, the wind load on that balloon is zero. Um, and so, therefore, it's really low risk. As soon as you start the fan, you create that sail action that the wind loads. So make sure your tie-off is completely set before you start the fan. Don't come back. Well, I'll get it later. Uh, later could be too late. Okay, I want to talk about the difference between static loads and dynamic loads and why do we care. 
When I talk about static loads, I'm really talking about the wind and the system is completely tight. The dynamic load concept is imagine that you've got this thing tied off, but you've got a long coil of rope between you and the truck. Then you get a wind gust. Then what happens is the balloon slides forward and now you've got things in motion. And then when you get to the end of the rope, things stop very quickly. That is a dynamic load on that rope and on the system. And the dynamic loads are inherently in the same wind condition. Dynamic loads will be dramatically higher than static loads. Uh, so in general, well, I'll cover that. So what I recommend is when you set up your tie off, put very little slack in it. You want the thing it doesn't have to be completely taut, you know, like a guitar string, but don't have 10 feet of coil in the rope. You need to have that set up with enough tension that the balloon's not gonna go anywhere uh, for a couple of reasons. The biggest thing is that when things move around, people get hurt, okay? You've got someone on the fan and now your balloon slides to the sideways or slides to the end of the rope and that's how you start, you know, taking off toes and ankles and things like that. But then, the other thing that happens is when the balloon gets to the end of the rope, the rope, the static force that we had, let's say that, you know, 1,000 pounds, 1,500 pounds we had before, it's at least double. And that doubling factor, really, it's, again, kind of hard to calculate because it depends on so many variables. But largely, if you've, if you've let the basket slide about five feet in a 10-knot wind, you will have doubled the force of that rope. And so, you know, just when it stops. And frankly, that dynamic loading of a system doesn't happen in a nice uniform way either. In a static load, everything is loaded consistently and all the system is kind of playing in harmony. But when you've got a dynamic load, it, there is a time lapse from a load on the carabiner and a load on the rope and a load on the other carabiners and the load on the bridle. Now that time might be minimal. I mean, it could be tenths of a second, but that time difference puts, pushes things to its max before you can distribute the load. So dynamic loading is really dangerous because it doubles the load and you get this, you get this impulse load rather than a static load. So a couple of things to just reduce the, the, the opportunity for dynamic is, like I say, reduce the slack of the tie-off. As soon as you stand the balloon up with hot inflation, get to the end of the tie-off. Uh, I mean, within seconds. Uh, not after your passengers are in and after you set the top and after you've had a nice bottle of water and talked to your launch director. As soon as you get that thing standing up, get to the end of the line. Because, as we heard earlier, well, the sudden gust of wind. Well, of course, but if you're a sudden gust of wind at the end of the rope, you look up, it's like, huh, that's windy. And then you lay it down. It's no big deal. But if you're not at the end of the rope and you get a sudden gust of wind and it slides you to the end of the rope, you just ran over three crew members and then you fall out of the basket on your face, the rope is loaded, you're not prepared, it gets messy, and then you're on TV for all the wrong reasons. So always, 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 as soon as you stand up, get to the end of the rope as quick as you can and that way you're preventing dynamic loading and you're getting into static loading. Um, in addition, I recommend using equipment, tie-offs especially, with a little less stretch. You know, we're not using bungee cords here. You're getting something that's going to be fixed under tension, and it's not going to stretch and then spring back and things like that because dynamic loading can be so dangerous. Okay, so always walk to the end of the tie-off. This is a picture here of the balloon standing up hot inflated. This is just a, a glow in the morning, uh, but here's this tie-off. I actually don't know how to make this light turn on. <laughs> there is actually a pilot in the basket. Um, uh, but as it turns out, the pilot was not particularly attractive. And uh, so the photographer asked him to get down in the basket so they could take a pretty picture. <laughs> I swear, then I stood up and everything was fine. <laughs> Because we heard earlier, it's bad to get out of the basket, right? We heard that. So we're going to walk that balloon to the end of the tie-off. And here at Fiesta, there's plenty of room to do that. And, you know, you've got a square that's 125 feet long. Once you get the thing stood up, get to the end of the line, then your launch director can come chat with you. Works out really well. Okay, so we've talked about all this expected load, but what's the takeaway with that? The takeaway that I really want people to walk away with there is this stuff is massively heavy. 
We're not talking about the five, six, seven hundred pound balloon that, that it weighs in the truck. You're really talking about five, six, seven thousand pounds. And so your, your level of equipment and care should reflect that. It's not that, well, I got to tie down something that's 500 pounds, a little mo motorcycle strap from Home Depot is fine. Uh, but we're talking about 10 times that. So we're going to talk about how do we find materials that will work. Okay, we can talk about webbing, rope, how do we attach it to the vehicle, what kind of carabiners, this thing called a climbing eight, and I've got some examples of all of that. Okay, webbing. Typically webbing, uh, what I mean by webbing is this kind of stuff. Uh, oftentimes you'll find two inch webbing, uh, seat belt webbing, that kind of thing. Um, Typically, the seatbelt webbing, the two-inch webbing, is rated for about 6,000 pounds, uh, which is right about the limit that we were talking about. And so in that sense, uh, it could be a suitable material. Now, um, it, one advantage to the webbing is, frankly, it rolls up really nicely, it's clean, it fits in the truck well, um, and it's relatively inexpensive. You can see by this picture from Amazon, uh, here is 10 yards, 30 feet for $13. That's not a big investment, and so it's inexpensive. Now, for me personally, I don't like using webbing as a tie-off. Uh, primarily because uh, I find uh, two things. Number one, I find that it abrades easily if you're going around corners and things like that. And it's really slick to handle. And if it, any of you have ever, ever tried to catch a drop line, um, it's really hard on the hands. And so it's, it's just hard to handle in that sense where ro rope typically has a, a better feel to it. Uh, it could be plenty strong, depending on how it's attached and things like that. So webbing could be a good alternative. I've seen people use webbing as sort of their secondary tie-off, totally fine. You could use a drop line as a secondary tie-off. It's probably strong enough, depending on the conditions. So webbing is an, is an opportunity. Uh, for me personally, I prefer rope. Um, what I have found is buying cheap rope that is not strong enough versus buying expensive rope that is super strong, it's not that much more expensive in the quantities that we're talking about. It is significantly more expensive. It might be double or triple the cost. And so, but you're talking 30, 40, 50 dollars. You're not talking hundreds of dollars. So, so in general, what I recommend with ropes is um, buy heavier rope. I think it's better. So there's oftentimes this debate about do I buy braided rope? Do I buy... Um, a twisted rope, do I want nylon, do I want polyester, do I want Kevlar, do I want Dyneema, uh, do, do I want some sort of fancy fiber. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, um, number one, you need to figure out what the application is and make sure that the rope behaves the way you want. And then the other thing is you don't care. It, it really doesn't matter that much. Uh, buy things that are strong enough. That's really the key. Um, and then there's sort of small pros and cons to various types of rope uh, that, that are potentially worth looking at. But I've got three different samples of rope up here, and we're actually going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but for example, uh, this rope here, uh, this is a 5 8 inch, uh, basically double braided nylon. And uh, this rope here will hold 18,000 pounds. Uh, and it has an eye splice in the end of it. And uh, this rope is extremely strong. Uh, this is my tie-off. I use it. It's overkill, um, and it's not terribly expensive. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but, but each one of you got a, an example of this, this blue tie-off, and we'll talk about the specific specs of this. This is a 5 8 inch double-braided nylon uh, with an eye splice and a nice end, uh, and this is about 12,000 pounds. Uh, this one here, again, 5 8 double braided nylon. You're seeing a trend here. Uh, this rope here is about 15,000 pounds. And so even just to say the same nylon, the same construction of rope, isn't always the same strength. It can depend on how it's woven, where it's made, all of those sorts of things. So they do change a little bit. Uh, so in general, all of those different preferences between nylon or polyester or Kevlar, they don't have a huge factor on tie-offs. And again, I have small preferences, but it's not really enough to argue about, in my opinion. Now, there is a, a, an interesting thing to note here about eye splices and knots and how do I att attach ropes to things. Uh, by far... Eye splices are better than any knot, okay? And in fact, in the handouts that you don't have, 
uh, remember, go to the website, davebear.co. In that handout, there is a link to an article that talks about how the strength of ropes diminish when you attach them to things. So when I put an eye splice, you don't get the full strength of the rope. A good eye splice should tolerate about 90% of the strength, but you lose 10%. Now you put a knot in there and you lose even more. And so there's also a lot of debate about what knots are strongest, that kind of a thing. Now growing up back in the dark ages, before the internet was invented, we learned bowling is the only knot to, that you ever have to know. Uh, and as it turns out, the bowling in various different testing conditions typically delivers about 75% of the strength of the rope. You could lose a quarter of the strength of the rope by putting a bowling in it. And so again, if you, ha if you could use an ice splice instead of a knot, do that because it's significantly stronger. Uh, there is another type of knot that, that you'll see in that article called an alpine knot. Uh, and that knot claims to hold about 90% of the rope. So it's almost as strong as an ice splice. And again, just, just think about that, but also consider what can you tie consistently, reliably every time. Uh, I typically use bolins because I, I can do it in my sleep, in the dark, backwards, all of those sorts of things. And it's just the knot I know, and it's fine. Uh, it's, not, it's not on the lower end of, of knots. There are some that are really, really bad. So, so read that article and go explore with some knots. Learn how to tie a couple of knots. Uh, learn how to tie them. Uh, genuinely, uh, this sounds like a joke, but learn how to tie them with your eyes closed. Uh, because when you need it, it will be dark. Uh, you're going to be doing a glow, you're going to be tying it around an axle of a truck, and you can't see, learn how to tie it in the dark so that you can feel confident about it, that kind of a thing. Um, so again, I talked a little bit about webbing. Another couple of things I like about rope where I get this personal preference is you can get rope in any length you want, any strength you want, just about any color you want. You can get it spliced, you can get it you know, trimmed, you can get whatever you want. And, and there's, a, there's a company out there that will make a rope that's actually braided with the balloons of your, with the color of your balloon if you want. And so, I mean, there's just all kinds of neat options. And we like things that are pretty and shiny. So go do that. Um, now I have found a couple of different rope vendors that I have I, I really like. Uh, the one that I that I use currently, because people often ask me where do you buy this stuff, is I use this company called Knot and Rope Supply. It's an online company. Uh, if you find what you want, you just order it, pay your money online, uh, and then they ship it to you. Uh, I I ordered this pink one and I had it I think in three or four days. Um, uh, one shout out to, to Knot and Rope is I ordered it and it was an unusual order and so they called me. I said, what are you doing? Why do you want this particular rope? So I described it and they said, oh, okay. Um, I, I don't think you ordered it right. What I'd recommend is this construction. It's, I think it's going to be better for you. So, so they're actually out there helping you. They're great guys. You can just pick up the phone and talk to them. So uh, I, prefer no, I prefer ropes over webbing personally and Knot and Rope is a great place to go. Now, a little bit more about this Fiesta gift. Uh, this is an excellent gift, and this is a fantastic piece of equipment. So this rope uh, came from Maple Leaf Ropes. It's a 5 8 inch double braided nylon, um, and uh, it's about 30 feet long from sort of tip to tail here. Um, it's got a nice eye splice in the end. You can see that eye splice is nicely whipped, so it's not going to, uh, it's not going to release over time. Uh, and then... As an end. Uh, the other end is also nicely whipped so the rope's not going to come, come apart at the end. Uh, this really is a, a, a nice quality piece of equipment and I like it a lot. Um, so this rope is uh, about 12,000 pounds strong. Uh, it's a little bit stronger than that. I think technically it was 12,325 pounds or something like that when I looked at it. Uh, and then the carabiner that they gave us is about a 10,000 pound carabiner. So when we talk about those expected loads, we talk about five, six, seven thousand 7,000 pounds. Uh, uh, this, set, this setup, if you don't put something weaker in the middle of it, uh, this will get you to 10,000 pounds, uh, which is heavier than most of our vehicles. Uh, and so this is a pretty good setup, uh, and just so that you know as you're using it, and we'll talk about a couple of ways to use it later, but that's a real good system there. Okay, now, how do you attach this thing to your car? So you've got your, your bridle, you've got your quick release, and you've got your tie-off, and it's rated at 12,000 pounds, and then you just walk up to your truck and you sort of loop it around the mirror, right? <laughs> I say that because I've seen it. 
um, you have to think about what's the weakest point in this whole system. So typically what I recommend is if you've got a vehicle with front tow hooks, use that. That tow hook is designed to move the vehicle and it is designed to be strong. It's typically attached directly to the frame. Something to be aware of with tow hooks though um, is some of them in some vehicles, they're open, they're just a hook. Um, and that is one of those uh, that I wanna let you know your tie off rope will slip off of that hook um, at precisely the wrong time. And so if you have open hooks, con consider replacing those or uh, I had open hooks on an old vehicle. What I actually did was I took one of those bridles and I went between the two tow hooks and it, then it was significantly more secure. So are your tow hooks open or closed? And then if you're thinking about a pickup, is it a half ton, three quarter ton? Because the tow hooks are rated significantly differently. You'll see that. Did you have a question? So the comment was if you have open hooks, assuming that they're pointed out, then you can run the rope sort of uh, through one and then attach to the other, and then that'll help it. For, and, and if you have any tension, because you didn't have a lot of slack in your line, then that'll keep it from slipping off. Great comment. Thank you. Um, so if you don't have good front tow hooks or you can't quite get your truck oriented right because you're at a rally and you got 17 people sharing your square and it's kind of snug, uh, your trailer hitch is probably okay. Now, think again about your trailer hitch and whether it's a class two, class three, class four, what kind of truck, and your trailer hitch most likely will have a weight rating on it. And that is designed to communicate how heavy can the trailer be that you're pulling. And it's a good rule of thumb that that's roughly how much weight it'll take before bad things start to happen. Now, in reality, it'll take more weight than it's rated for because that manufacturer has given it a safety rating. Um, but just to be aware, a class three hitch, which is what you'll find on something like a, a most half tons pickups will have it, all three quarter tons will have that. Uh, you'll get up to 6,000 pounds, so you're in the realm of reasonable. Uh, if you get up into a one ton truck uh, or the hitch that is just kind of that extra heavy box, then you'll get up more into the 10,000 pounds, things like that. So. We can say we can attach to the trailer hitch, but not the trailer, okay? Now, I, I use a trailer, and there are times that I'll park sideways and I'll attach to the trailer hitch, and uh, there's a couple of ways that I do that. I'll take the rope and actually wrap it around the receiver and tie it off tight, or you can clip to the safety chain area, depending on how your vehicle's made. That safety chain might not be very strong, but think about, remember, the purpose of a safety chain connection uh, in the trailing world is if you drop the hitch, it's supposed to catch your trailer and allow you enough time to recover and stop. So generally, again, they're weighted uh, strong enough, and there's also two of them, and so they're only rated about half as strong as the actual hitch. If you've got a 6,000-pound trailer hitch, each of those safety chain connection points is only rated at about half that. And so just be aware, and again, every vehicle's different and, and that kind of thing, but, but there's some good attachment points there. Um, we talk about not tying off to trailers. You probably have all heard it a million times. It was in the video, but I'm going to give a couple of, in my opinion, practical reasons why you don't do that. Number one, the trailer's not heavy enough. Uh, if we're talking about these loads of four, five, six, seven thousand 7,000 pounds, then your trailer probably doesn't weigh that. Um, and even if it does actually weigh that, you don't have that much friction between the tires and the ground. And so as soon as you put that kind of load, you're gonna to start to slide the trailer around, or I've seen people go underneath the trailer up into the trailer hitch, and as soon as you get that gust of wind and false lift, then you'll actually pick it up, flip the trailer over. They're just not heavy enough. The other reason why we don't attach things to trailers is because when things go badly, they move a lot, and that movement starts to hurt people. And so you might say, well, I could, I could drag a vehicle. Yeah, you can, but you won't drag a vehicle very far. And when you drag a vehicle because of your tie-off, it will drag in a very predictable way. If you start to drag a trailer, it does not drag in a predictable way. Bad things happen very quickly. So we don't tie off to trailers. It does not matter whether it's a double axle, single axle, whether it's, you know, whether it's gold or pink, it doesn't matter. It's not big enough. Don't do it. We know that. Okay, and then here you'll see a picture of a custom hook. Uh, this is on the side of a Tommy lift, and uh, the individual who installed the Tommy lift said, oh, I can just weld a couple of hooks on the side. 
great. That's fine. Um, you know, Cousin Eddie's a welder. He can do whatever you want, right? The, the good rule of thumb that I would talk to your welder about if he's going to do that is you need to build this thing to withstand 10,000 pounds of force. Now, the reason I say that is because it's probably a little heavier than you need, but frequently welders are not welding under that kind of load. They think, oh, it's plenty strong because they're welding a motorcycle trailer or something like that, and they're, they're having a strap down. It needs to handle hundreds of pounds, not thousands. So if you're going to have something custom welded, I like to, to say, you know, make sure that this thing is going to hold 10,000 pounds. And if he says, oh, I don't know, how would I know that? He's probably not your guy. And so just be aware of that. You can do custom hooks. A couple things to watch out for. Is it bolted onto the truck? If so, then you've got to look at each of those elements. Is the ring strong enough? Is the bracket strong enough? Is the bolt strong enough? And then is that, is that ring forged or welded? A lot of times you'll look at rings or D-rings, and if you just hold it in your hand, you'll see that little seam down the middle, and it's welded. And those welded rings are not nearly as strong as a forged ring, and so you want something that is really going to be stout. Again, we're talking about expected loads and of 10,000 pounds-ish, so make sure that all of your equipment can handle that. Okay, and then how do I, okay, I've decided where it goes, but how do I attach it, right? Well, you can buy carabiners just about anywhere. Uh, you can buy them at Home Depot. I buy these things a lot. Um, this one uh, must be super strong, uh, and it says um, not for climbing. Um, but that's probably just a liability issue. It's plenty, right? Um, so just to, as a rule of thumb, the working load of this carabiner is 150 pounds. Um, clearly, that's not going to do the job. Then if you go into something like a climbing store, you go to REI, you can buy a carabiner. Typically what they're doing is they're going to have uh, carabiners and equipment that's going to hold hundreds of pounds. Uh, think about that dynamic load of a climber falling. That, those carabiners are typically going to be rated somewhere six, eight, uh, six or 800 pounds, maybe 1,000. REI and those kinds of stores, they do sell some heavier equipment. Um, the good rule of thumb is any good carabiner will have its weight rating printed right on it. And so if you've got carabiners at home, go look at it. It will tell you. Um, and they will either talk about pounds or kilonewtons. Um, now, what the heck is a kilonewton? Uh, a kilonewton is a measure of force that is roughly equivalent to 225 pounds. And so, for example, as a good rule of thumb, this is a little less than, a, than one kilonewton strong. And so, again, you can start to do the math. If you're looking for a 10,000 pound uh, carabiner, you want 45 kilonewton. That's what Fiesta gave you. It actually says 45 kilonewtons printed right on it. So, look for carabiners uh, that have that weight rating printed right on it. And if it doesn't, it's probably not that strong. Um, so then, when you're buying carabiners, think about how, you know, it, does it screw down or not? Um, this one is a little spring clip, and I realize we're not using this for tiles, but this spring sort of gets dirty, it gets messed up, and it could come loose, it could be just hanging open. Everything that we're using in the ballooning world is typically going to be a screw down. It could be a screw down or a spring uh, holder, whatever that, that, you know, there's a lot of different mechanisms, but you want a way that ensures that that carabiner is going to stay closed and stay locked. Um, so we look at the, we look at the strength, we look about whether it screws down, and then we look at the gate opening size. When you open that thing, how big is that gap? Uh, does anybody here drive a three quarter ton Ford? Here's a handful of you. The front tow hooks on those things are massive. They're super strong, but you can't get a carabiner on them. And so, hence the vendor up here called Omega Pacific. They sell this specific carabiner, and it has a massive gate opening on it. And so this one is a, this is a 72 kilonewton carabiner with a massive opening, and it'll go right over that front tow hook and things like that. So you could go out and buy a real shiny carabiner and get it home, and you can't get it attached to your truck, and that's less helpful. So be aware of that. One other thing to note about carabiners and when they talk about load, typically that load, you might see two different strength or load numbers on a carabiner. You'll typically, if there are two, you'll see one that has arrows up and down if the carabiner is held like that. That means when the carabiner is under load like this, like we do in line, that's the strength of the carabiner. The other one is has the arrow sideways, and that is when it's side loaded. 
A side-loaded carabiner is not nearly as strong as when it's loaded correctly. And so be aware that if you attach things to your vehicle and it's not quite right, it's sitting there kind of wonky, if you're side-loading a carabiner, you'll cut the strength in half uh, or more. And so be, just be considerate of that. That was why I invested in this one with the big gate, so then I know it's going to sit when it's under tension. It's going to actually be under the, the right load profile. Uh, at, when you're shopping for this kind of equipment, Amazon is your friend, frankly. Amazon has become amazing, and the nice thing about it is all of the specs of this equipment are clearly stated. So it will tell you exactly how big it is and how much it costs, and of course, Amazon has a great return policy. So go buy three. Go buy a couple that you, that you want to experience, experiment with, see how they attach to things, and then if you don't like them, take them back. It's fine. Uh, Amazon also has a business as a lending library for those of you that didn't know that. Uh, you can just borrow stuff from them and then send it back. Um, I recommend not using it heavily and sending it back a year later, but genuinely, if you don't know what fits on your truck, order two or three, figure out what you like and send the others back. It's really okay if that enables you to get the right thing. Okay, another piece of equipment we often see in this operation is something like a figure eight, a climbing eight, a descender. Those are all different words for the same thing and it's stuff that looks like this, okay? This is a, a piece of aluminum. It's, it's, this is forged anodized aluminum. Uh, anodized basically in this context means uh, I coated it and made it shiny, and forged means that it was all built at one time. There's no seams, it's not welded, that kind of thing. So the term forged is important for our use. Anodized, uh, not terribly. Uh, especially because we're not going to abuse them with a lot of different corrosives and things like that. So figure eight, descender, climbing eight, belay eight, they all mean the same thing. They're all just different words. Some of them that you find are going to have ears. That's these kind of pointy things on the side. Those are the ears, and we'll talk a little bit about why you might care. Here's an example of the same thing without ears. Uh, this one is 35 kilonewtons. This one's 45 um, uh, and again, on Amazon, just if you wanted to use these kinds of things, uh, this thing was about, I think, uh, 12 or $13 on Amazon, uh, and then the real heavy-duty one, I think this was $18. And so it's not big money. If you want them, in my opinion, it's worth, it's worth a few extra bucks to do it. Um, so just like carabiners, a good climbing age will have the weight, the strength listed on it. If it is not printed on it, in my opinion, don't trust it because it might look the same, it might feel the same, but it might not be the same. And I'm looking at it right now, I was wrong, this is 50 kilonewtons, so that's quite a bit. Uh, that puts this at about 12,000 pounds. <coughs> Something else that, uh, I'm not sure how well you can see this picture, um, but there, this is an illustration of uh, tether rings between two carabiners. So the bottom carabiner here is attached to the basket, and then the top carabiner is the envelope, and then they put a ring in the middle, okay? These have a lot of nicknames. They're tether rings, they're elephant rings. I've heard them called a variety of different things. Uh, they're actually quite common in Europe. Uh, they have two values here. One is uh, that um, for, I, I fly, by the way, a Cameron Viva. It only has eight wires on it. And so inherently, there is a half a twist in every single corner of my basket all the time. You never really know, is it hooked up right? That looks twisted. Well, yes, it is, because there's a half a twist every time. Because you take your two carabiners, and they really should lay flat, but they don't. They lay at 90 degrees. So tether rings will then align those so that then everything just fits a little bit nicer. It's mostly aesthetics that doesn't affect the strength too much. But the other advantage is then you've got a dedicated spot that you can run ropes, you can clip things to, and you, you avoid the risk of side-loading any of your balloon carabiners. Because if you've got a rope or other carabiners attached, you run the risk of side-loading one of your balloon carabiners, so tether rings are a good alternative there. Uh, and most manufacturers sell them. Uh, I talked to Cameron and uh, Kubicek, and they both said, yeah, we sell them. Uh, and I, I remember the price being sort of reasonable. I want to say that they were like 20 or $30 a piece. Again, not free, but not huge dollars, um, just to be aware of. Um, I wanted to go to the next slide, but I'm not. Uh-oh, I need Zarek again. Uh-oh. 
Yes, please. It could be just a user problem. Okay. So these figure eights you'll see in a couple of the configurations that we're, that we're going to talk about. And um, so when you're designing your tie-off, and one more, there you go. What I want to encourage you to do is when you buy all this equipment and you hook it all up together, you determine where you put the weak point, okay? What is the weakest chain, right? Because a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So you choose where to put the weak link, okay? In the way I've built my personal system, the weak link is my truck. Um, that my truck does not weigh nearly as much as my tie-off will hold, and so I will drag the truck across the field before anything breaks. Um, that's where I've decided to make the weak link. Um, but so be, uh, be aware of where it is, and the lowest rated thing in the chain is going to be the strength of your whole system then. Go ahead, Zarek. Oh, that was fast. Let's go back a couple. Oh, I have control. I don't think that's true. Okay. Now, we've talked about expected loads. We've talked about sort of where to go get all this equipment. What are some options? Let's talk about quick releases and a few different um, kind of varieties that you might see out there on the field. Okay. Now, all of this information is in your slides and in your handouts, and I, so I'm going to move through these fairly quickly, but I do want to just kind of give you an illustration of five different options. The first one is the snap shackle, and I'm going to talk about pros and cons, okay? There is no perfect system. Everyone has pros and cons. Uh, the benefit of this system is it's pretty simple, it's clean, it's obvious how to use it, it's fairly strong, it's about 7,000 pounds, and it's relatively cheap. A lot of us, it sort of came with the balloon, and so we just use it. And so the downsides of this is it can hang up under load, and sometimes it's hard to get released. Um, the other thing is I've broken three of these personally um, because when I wanted to let it go, I just yanked on it and tore the thing in half. It worked, but I broke it. Um, and you do that enough that, that it starts to uh, get expensive over time. So then the other downside of this one is you're fully committed. Once you release that, you pull the pin, you're done. There's no going back. Um, and you can see in this picture, it's got a hard eye. In this case, it's a plastic eye. Uh, it, you, you must use an eye on this. If you use a soft rope or a splice, it doesn't work as well. You can see in these pictures, um, on the left-hand side, when it's closed, it's fine, and, and it'll attach to the rope just fine. This is a case where I put this Fiesta rope under load, and then I release the snap shackle, and it hangs up right there because that snap shackle has a little bulb on the end of it, and, that's, and that eye splice or a knot will actually hold that, and now you can't get off of your tire off, except you're also not real secure, so you're in this middle ground, which is not a deal, so always use a hard eye on the rope. Okay, Bonanno is a second release option. I have one up here. Uh, many of you may have seen these. Um, I used to not like this at all. Uh, I felt really negative about it, primarily because I felt like there was this big chunk of metal right here about eye level, and as soon as I released it, it's probably going to come back and hit me in the face. Uh, it turns out uh, I was doing it wrong. Uh, there is a right way to use this, and that wasn't it. Uh, so this is designed not to be put on a bridle at all. This is designed, this hole here attaches to your carabiner directly. And so it's, it's fixed to the corner of your basket. Then you put a, a webbing or a bridle through here and then a rope through that bridle. And then when you release this, that bridle lets go and the rope slides off the end. And this never moves. So this is not a projectile if it's used as it was designed. I never did. This became distasteful to me, but it was a user problem. Uh, the benefits, again, this thing is really strong, uh, and it releases very clean, even under extreme loads. It works really well. Uh, like I say, the con is it's frequently used incorrectly, um, and I'll show you a picture of what it, what it looks like. And I've talked about two ropes. It's, it requires is a little strong, but it's close. Uh, and also, these are a little bit more expensive. Uh, you can buy these at least from Kubacek. It's on their website that the Bonanno Quick Release, I believe it's about $75. Um, so you're starting to pay real money. Um, 
And so you can see in this picture the carabiner or the bonanno is attached directly to a carabiner, directly to the corner of a basket. It's not flopping around at eye level. And then on, you can see on this left picture it's attached to the bridle and there's a rope at the bottom of that bridle. That was my... The only problem that, that I've found is if you only attach to one corner with anything, bonanno or not, is that if you do have a strong wind, it pulls your basket sideways. And that can be an issue if you're in the middle of a burn. Absolutely. And so this case, where you see on the left-hand picture, they've attached a bridle to avoid that problem. If you just put the banano on the corner and a rope on the banano, then you've got one pivot point and your basket can slide around. That's a great point, Beth. Thank you. Okay, three-ring circus. Now, um, this came out of the parachute industry. And uh, I used one of these for years. Here's an example of one. Uh, you can see this one I've actually spliced into this rope, again, with the idea that then I don't have a big chunk of metal at eye level. And so I like that. The piece I'm holding on to sort of attaches to the basket, usually around that bridle, and then it releases. And so it would allow you to, um, it, it's a very smooth release. It releases under load very well. And you typically get very little snap back with this. Whereas the snap shackle and the banano, the release is so fast that that rope will spring back. Uh, and I've actually seen where they put a metal eye in a rope and that'll go back and go through the windshield of a truck and things like that. Of course, that's a hazard if you've got crew there. Uh, so those kinds of things are not great. Um, these are a little bit more expensive. Uh, the last time I bought one, I think it was about $50. Uh, not horrible. Um, one thing that the, the primary reason why I've moved away from this is I really like the operation of it, but it's not very strong. It's only 3,500 pounds, um, and primarily because of the way it's constructed in the rings. And you can get some that are stronger and weaker. This particular one is rated about 3,500 pounds, uh, and I, I decided I want something a little bit more heavy duty than that. For those of you who have never seen a, a three-ring circus in action, um, if this plays, you can sort of see how this video will demonstrate it. So you pull this pin and then the rings just gradually unfold and that's what allows you to ease in and that's what helps to minimize some of that snap back on the rope uh, because you're actually releasing the rope a little bit more gradually. Now clearly they've slowed it down here. Uh, it's still fast. Uh, when you release it, you're, you're done. Uh, you're fully committed. There's no putting it back together. Um, there's also one other negative to this quick release uh, that uh, Luckily, I only saw one time, uh, but it was really bad, and that was a crew member was holding on to it, and the, crew, and the pilot pulled the, pulled the wire, and the ring flipped over and smashed his finger. Um, and so that was quite, uh, and it was under a lot of load and things like that, so that can be pretty dangerous, uh, just something to be aware of. There is also a sort of rope-only version of the three-ring circus that doesn't have the metal rings in it. Uh, I have not used this. I have seen a couple of versions of it out there on the market uh, that I did not like. Um, and this one, I've not used it, but uh, this comes from Paul Stump. Uh, and frankly, I trust his opinion. He, he thinks pretty heavily about his equipment, uh, and he really likes this one. The old ones that I didn't like, all the rope, what would happen is you have a loop of rope and just like that snap shackle, there's a little bulb where that rope folds in half and it would actually bind up under heavy load. So just be aware of that. Uh, Paul says that this one uh, releases extremely smoothly uh, and it's rated quite strong. Uh, I think this one is, uh, is a little above 5,000 pounds, so it's pretty good. Again, I'm not as familiar with this, but I did find it doing my research. Uh, okay, so a rope with a climbing eight is our next example. We've got two more, uh, and then we'll get you out of here. A rope with a climbing eight, just to let you know, this is what I'm using right now. So this is an eye splice and a rope with a carabiner that goes to the truck. So that goes back here. And then I've got this, I've got this climbing eight sort of in the middle of the rope. It's not quite in the middle, but it's knotted at an end, you can see. And I've got about somewhere on the order of about 20 feet on the, on the truck side, and I've got about 10 feet on the balloon side. And so the way this works is you can see here, this is when it's open. 
Uh, and so uh, on the right-hand side is the truck. The, the climbing eight's in the middle. It goes up through the carabiners and then back down. And then when you come, when you, uh, come through the climbing eight here, then you tie it. And you can tie it in a variety of ways, but it's very simple. What I typically do is effectively just put a kind of a, a, a slip knot in it and then chain the end of it uh, so that you can release it. Now, the benefit of this that I like is there's not all this connection point. I, I know exactly how many, I've got fewer moving parts, which makes me feel better. Uh, I like that this whole thing stays on the ground and I fly away so I don't have the bridle hanging in my face. Um, there's, very low, there's very low friction because it flows through the, uh, the climbing eight. Uh, and it's relatively low cost. And so that allows you to, to get a really nice, a strong tie off without very much money. Um, a couple of tips if you're going to use the rope with a climbing aid. A couple of things to, to remember is uh, that you want to go through the envelope carabiners, not the basket carabiners, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because the envelope is the thing you're trying to hold to the ground. The basket is not likely to leave on its own. And so take out another moving point, another connection point. But also, something interesting, I didn't do that recently on a tether, and I put it under load. Um, a real windy day, and then I deflated the balloon, and then my carabiners actually pinched the rope between the carabiner and the burner frame, and I couldn't get it off at all. So always use your envelope carabiners, and on the smooth side, not the screw down side. Uh oh, I think I lost control again. Okay. David, one more comment. I have actually done this too on if no matter what your tie off, you need to tie to the envelope carabiners because when I tied uh, to the basket carabiners and got a big gust, I actually broke the burner frame. Yeah, they will break. So here's a video you can see where I'm in the air here and the rope just gradually reduces its friction because right now it's got three points of friction, the climbing eight and then two carabiners. Now it's got two points of friction, so I'm gradually accelerating into the wind. This helps me to minimize false lift. And then it's got one connection point and then it just falls to the ground. You'll notice no snapback. This allows you to launch in fairly significant winds and minimize false lift and you don't have that dramatic sense of release so you won't have swinging. Uh, and the other thing I like about this, you saw at the beginning of the video, uh, that I can just sit there and hold it with one hand because the system has enough friction that you can technically release it and then just wait and kind of be ready to go. Uh, there is a way that you can actually use uh, uh, two of these uh, climbing eight. Uh, it's very similar. The difference here that you see in this picture is this is a big ride balloon uh, and this rope uh, the, the, ro the white rope on the top actually goes to the, to the top rail of the basket uh, and it has the, the welded poles in the frame which is a decent anchor point, uh, wraps around the cables. It's not as strong as the envelope carabiners uh, but then we come up, we go around that figure eight with, with ears, we come back through the loop and then we tie it around all four pieces of rope. This is extremely strong. Uh, the downside of this one is, number one, it requires a balloon with a welded frame uh, where the pole sockets are tall and it's actually part of the structure. The other thing is this also requires a crew person to let it go because you can't reach it. Okay, last thing, and then we'll, we'll be done here. The rope only is exactly the same as the figure eight, just without the piece of metal in the middle. So the advantage of it is there's no metal in the middle and, and the, you know, less moving parts. The downside of this is as you end up building that, running the rope through the loop, that is a friction point and it can bind up, especially if your rope starts to wear. Uh, you do get a little wear over time and that kind of a thing. Again, the same rules, carabiners on the envelope, and then this is just a, uh, right here. This is just a loop that's, that's tied in the rope. Okay, so today we hit the highlights of sort of the expected loads. Where do we buy all this material? And then examples of pros and cons. Just a few closing thoughts around this. I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and, and a handful of takeaways. Uh, number one is really go experiment, go try it, talk to other pilots. Hey, what are you doing there? Why are you doing that? I recommend that a lot. Uh, and then don't underestimate the loads of these balloons. These things are massive and with just a little bit of wind, uh, it's got way more force than you want it to. Um, always get all of this rigged up before you start the fan. Again, we're trying to avoid dynamic load. Uh, by getting that rope, getting the slack out of the rope. Uh, and then 
as a rule of thumb, try to design your system for somewhere on the order of about 10,000 pounds. Might be overkill, uh, but you won't underestimate it then. And then my recommendation is use a tie-off every single time. Get in the habit, get used to it, become proficient with it, and then when you do have that gust during inflation, it won't be a surprise, uh, and you'll know how to use it at that point. So I recommend using it every time. Okay? Thank you for your time. I know some of you have questions for David, but uh, uh, whoever wants to leave, since our time is about up, um, we'll do the final, final wrap up here. And then if you are still interested, uh, David can hang around for a couple minutes to answer questions. So again, please fill these out. There are boxes on the chairs by, by every exit. And, and put them in the boxes so that we have that information available to us. Uh, also, please, again, clean up after yourselves. Throw your garbage away so we don't have to stay here all night doing it. And thank you, everyone, for coming. We appreciate your participation. And we'll go back to David for a little while for whoever has questions. <laughs>